Hey there, internets. I'm Michael, and this is Two Can Play That Game. And today we are beginning our look at a game called Elysium. Now, I have already done a unboxing of this, so if you are interested in seeing that, please do check it out. And of course, my next video, you'll be able to see an example of this game being played if you're interested in that. And then the final video in this series will be my review of the game where you can find out my thoughts and opinions on Elysium and of course, whether or not two can play that game. So what is Elysium? Well, let's look at the box. So we have here, we've got a Cyclops, some guys in armor fighting, a woman wearing a kind of togaresh outfit uh, with some wispy smoke and a long ship and we've got some Greek writing. So not surprising that this is set in Greece but beyond that it's not really telling us much. Maybe there's something mythological going on? Well, there is, because in Elysium, you are playing a demigod and you are all demigods at the table and you are competing to try and become a god and join the ranks of Olympus. Now, the way you're doing that is to collect victory points. So why don't you join me at the table for a closer look on how to play Elysium. Welcome to the table for how to play Elysium. So as I've already said, the goal of this game is to end the game with the most victory points and you'll have five rounds in which to do so and these rounds are called epochs. So before I go into how the turns work, let's first get the game all set up. So the first thing you're gonna to want to do is set up the quests for determining turn order. So to do this, you'll first place the pediment somewhere beside the play order. And this has two sides and that differs just where the colors lie. So you just pick one randomly at the start of the game and you'll set that out. Then you'll need to set out the quests starting with number one on the left, ranging through to number four. And this would be if you were playing a three or four player game, you would have it set up like this. However, we're going to set up for a two player game. So we put away all these quests that have the three and four dots on. And instead, we want the quests that only have the two dots on. These are then set out between the colors. So that there is a gap in the middle and what this means is the either yellow or green applies to the first position here and the second position is blue or red. And obviously this is why if we switch this, first would be blue and red, second would be yellow and green. The final thing for this part of the setup is to put the steps out, which will simply go at the bottom of the quests and these list on them the round numbers from one to five. So you'll want to put this white token on the first round marker for the start of the game, and then it will move up as the rounds progress throughout the game. Next, you'll need to place all the tokens you'll need through the game near the board. So we have the coins will need to be set somewhere within reach of all players, the victory point tokens, the trigger rings, and if you are going to be playing with the Ares God, you'll also need to put out the prestige point tokens. So next we want to set out the player areas. So each player will need to assemble their player board. It will be coming in two pieces. And then all you'll need to do is slot those pieces together and that then assembles your player board. Next, you'll need to randomly determine who your first player is going to be. 
So you'll get the player order tokens, you'll just shuffle them up and then distribute them randomly to each player and they will sit to the right of the player board in this little slot here. Once you've determined the first player, just deal the rest of the tokens in clockwise order to the remaining players. Any of the discs you don't need to use for your players, then just put back in the box. Next, you'll need to give each player four of these gold tokens and they'll sit in this section here of the player board. And then you'll need to give each player four columns, one of each of the colors, which they can set in the middle section here. The final thing each player will need is a number of victory points equal to their player order token. So for instance, whoever has the player one token will receive one victory point. Whoever has two will receive two victory points and so on. So with each player set up, the next thing you need to do is to decide which of the five families of gods you will be using in this game. The way I like to determine this, if I'm doing so randomly, is to just take one card from each of the gods, shuffle them up and then deal out five and those would be the ones I use. However, for this video, I'm just going to set out using the example starting set of gods, which are Athena, that has a kind of blacky gray coloring to the cards and an owl symbol. Hades, who are brown with a wolf symbol. Hephaestus, which are yellow with a hammer symbol. Poseidon, which are blue with a pair of dolphins as a symbol. And finally, Zeus, which is purple with a hand holding a lightning bolt as a symbol. So with these cards all got out of the box, we then need to put them all together into one big deck and shuffle it up. You then need to create the Agora in the middle of your play area. The number of cards that will be in your Agora is equal to the number of players times three plus one. Therefore, for a two-player game, it is seven cards. For a three-player game, it would be 10 cards. And for a four-player game, it is 13 cards. So I'm gonna set out the Agora here for a two-player game. So I'm just gonna put out seven cards. But you'll set those cards out in the middle of the play area so that everyone can see what they are. Then the rest of your cards you'll want to put face down within easy reach of all players. Then you'll want to put your level bonus tokens, which there are three of, one for one, one for two, and one for three, in reach of all players. And then your 10 family bonus tiles within easy reach of all players. There are two for each family, one with a value of five, one with a value of two, and you'll need to pick out the tokens for the families you are using in this game because you'll only be using five of the eight. So that is then the game all set up. And for a two player game, your table should look something like this. Additionally, if you were using the Apollo family of cards, you would also have to set out the Oracle. Um, this is that blue board. You just have that set elsewhere on the table with four cards underneath that would later be going into your Agora. So as I've said, the cards here that are available for you to buy is your Agora. Then within your own playing area, you have your domain, which is the bit above your playing board. And you have your Elysium, which is the bit below your playing area. And that's important to keep in mind as a lot of the rules explanation will be using these terms. So now let's talk about the layout of these cards for each of the families. So the color of the card, both at the top here and around the borders, represents the family. So this is brown, so it is Hades. Additionally, the family symbol is given below the number. The number here 
is the level of card. So the options for the level of card range from one, two or three. Then in the top right here, we have the columns you must possess still on your player board in order to buy this card. Now, obviously green is green, where it's black here, that means it just needs to be any other one column. Some cards will require two columns, some will only require one. Next, we have the name of the card. Then on the left here, we have the symbol that represents when the power of the card can be used. So this symbol here with the hourglass means it is a Kronos power and only comes into effect during the final scoring. If you have a arrow, that means it is an activate power and you turn it sideways to activate it and you can do this once each epoch while the card is in your domain. This snake symbol means that you can only use it if you have another card with a snake symbol in your domain as well. Then when that power can actually be used is represented by the smaller symbol down here. So in this case, it says that it's an activates power. So if you had two snakes symbols in your domain, you'd be able to use this activate power in the same way as a normal activate power, turning it sideways in order to gain the benefit. If the power has a lightning bolt symbol, then that means it is an instant power. So whenever, as soon as you buy that card, you gain whatever that power would give you, but you'll only ever have it once. Then we have the trigger symbol. And for those, when you buy this card, you will take one of these ring tokens and put it with that card. This is a one use power, but you can choose when you use it by discarding the trigger token. It's important to be aware with all powers, you can only use them during your turn. Additionally, if it has the affinity symbol, that means it is a permanent power. And as long as it remains in your domain, it is an effect. And finally, we have the Lear symbol, and that is used during the legend phase. So that is all the symbols that the powers have. Then in the box at the bottom here, you have a symbol representing what the powers are and short text telling you the power. If you need any further clarification on the powers, the game does come with a booklet which gives greater detail on all the different powers if you have any questions with them. Final thing to note with these cards is that anything referring to a citizen, that is just the back side of one of these cards, is the image of a citizen and that counts as a citizen whenever it is face down. Next, let's talk about the layout of the quest cards. So in the top here, you have the turn order number that you'll get for buying that quest. Then at the bottom of the card here, we have what you gain during the legend phase. So there'll be a number of gold, a number of transfers that you can make, and potentially a number of victory points if you're playing with three or four people. So the game is made up of epochs, and in a game you'll have five epochs as marked on this tracker, and each epoch is divided into four phases. We have the Awakening, which is where you'll be setting out your cards in the Agora each round. And I'll go through that more in more detail in a moment. You have the Actions phase, where you will be using your columns in order to buy either cards from the Agora or quests. The third phase is the Legends phase, and this is where you will be writing cards from your domain into your Elysium. 
Cards in your domain you'll gain the benefit of the powers on them for, but they will not count towards your scoring for the end of the game. However, cards in your Elysium, you do not gain the powers on those cards, but they count towards scoring. So when you are writing your legend in the legend phase and moving cards from your domain to your Elysium, you will be stopping gaining any benefits of powers on them, but you will start to collect the sets for final game scoring. So then the final phase is the end of the epoch. And this is just where you tidy up the board ready for your next epoch. So you'll put your columns back on your board and you'll turn back any activate powers that you had activated. You'll reset those ready to use in the next epoch. And additionally, we will move the epoch marker, at which point we would then go back round to the awakening phase of the next epoch. So now let's talk about each of those phases in more detail. Let's talk about the awakening phase. Now you can skip this during the first epoch because it is basically to do with the way the game is set up. So then in your second and future epochs though, you'll need to discard any cards that are left in the Agora and then put out the same number of cards again as you did during setup. So for this two player game here, it would be seven. Then we move on to the actions phase and you'll start with the person who has the first player marker and then go on to the person with the player two, three and four and so on. And each person will take one action and that action will either be buying a card from the Agora or buying a quest. You'll buy three cards from the Agora on one quest. In order to buy a card, you must have the prerequisite columns on your player board. So during your first action, you will be able to buy any cards that you wish as you have all four colors of columns available to you. But let's say it was later in the game and I only had green and yellow left. Well, that would mean I could only buy cards that used green and yellow. So if we look at these quests here, I wouldn't be able to buy the number one quest because I'd have to have either a red or a blue. However, I could buy the number two quest because that requires green or yellow. Additionally, with the cards down here, any that have blue or red as part of their requirement cost, I would not be able to buy only those with greens or yellows. This one that's a green and a wild, I would be able to buy because I do have green and one other color. The important thing to note when you are buying these cards is that you do not need to spend the color of the card you are buying. So for example, this card here requires a green column. I have a green column on my player board, but because it requires a green column, that does not mean I have to spend my green column to buy it. I can choose to buy this spending my yellow, at which point that then goes into my domain. If it had an instantaneous power, that would then trigger. Also, at any point during your turn of action, you may activate any of your cards, activate abilities or trigger abilities. So with player two having gone, bought buying a card, it would then go to player one, buying a card, then back to player two until each player has bought a quest and free cards. If it is your action, and let's say player one had bought that, that and that already, and it was player two's turn and they only had the red column left on their board, there is now nothing they could buy because there's nothing that has red as the prerequisite. Everything requires other colors that player two does not have. If at this point the player has already bought their quest, then they must take a citizen instead of a card from the Agora or their quest. To do so, you would draw a card off the top of the deck, face down without looking at it, and place it in your domain. These citizens are negative points at the end of the game, whether or not they are in your domain 
or in your Elysium. However, it's important to note that citizens count as wilds in order to complete sets for scoring within your Elysium. And I'll talk more about that when I talk about writing legends. So let's talk about this situation we had where player two is unable to buy anything. But let's say they'd already bought three cards from the Agora and they still needed to buy a quest this, this epoch. Well, they would then have to take whatever quest is left and they would take it face down rather than face up. So the face downside is gray and has no number there. If you are taking the face down side, that means you are automatically the last player. Additionally, the benefits you gain from that quest for writing legends will always be you can only write one card into your Elysium and you will only get one gold. However, you can only take the backside of a quest once all other players have taken their quests during this epoch. Each player has bought their three cards and one quest, you would then move on to the next phase. So this is then the legends phase. And the first thing you all need to do in this phase is that each player should have a quest in front of them, either with the red side up or with the gray side up. If they have the gray side up, they automatically take the last player token for however many players you're playing with. If they have the red side up, they take the player token that matches the quest card they have. So in the situation we have here, player two took the two player one, so they would keep this two player token and player one, the one player one. However, if they'd bought the other way around, they would simply swap these and that would then also immediately change play order. Then in that play order, as dictated by the play order discs, you would take the benefits stated on your quest. So if for this one, it would be free gold and free transfers. So from the bank, the player would take free gold to add to their player board, and they would then be able to do free transfers. The number of transfers does vary depending on the quest. To transfer a card from your domain into your Elysium, you must pay a number of gold equal to the level of the card. So a level one card costs one gold to transfer, two, two gold, three, three gold. And this transfer is called writing the card to your legend. When you do this, you choose what set to add it to. If you have no existing sets to add a card to, you simply put it below and it will become a set when you add additional cards to that. However, you cannot move cards around that are already in your Elysium. So if I had these cards in my Elysium already, I couldn't then choose to adjust the way the sets were made. If I already had a set like this and these separate, I couldn't then later on within my Elysium add them together to make a set. The set must be made when you put them in. Now, the kinds of sets you're looking to make are either family sets with the numbers one, two, and three of the same color of card for the same god, or you're trying to make level legends which is sets of the same number, but they must all be of different gods, so different color cards. So a family set can only ever consist of two or three cards, and a numbers set can consist of between two and five cards. If you complete a family set, so you have the one, two, and three, of a family in your Elysium, you will immediately take the appropriate bonus tile for that god. So if you are the first person to take one, it will be the five bonus victory points. If you're the second person, it would only be two victory points. The same player can take both the first and second of the same god. Also, with the level legends, if you're the first person to create 
a level legend, such as here we have a level one legend, you will take the corresponding bonus tile for that, as marked by the number at the top. So there is one for level ones, one for level twos, and one for level threes. As long as you have more cards in your level legend than anyone else does of that same level, you will continue to keep this bonus tile. But if someone else has more, so let's say player one had these two cards and currently had the level one legend bonus, but someone else created a level legend of three cards, they would immediately take this bonus tile from player one and they would get it. Of course, if you're the first person to get five cards in a level legend, you then have the most and no one can get more than you, so you are guaranteed to keep that bonus tile. So the final thing to talk about with writing these legends is with regards to the citizens. So I spoke earlier about how they could be a wild card. So let's talk about a situation where a player had a one and a three of Zeus in their Elysium already, and they wanted to get a two of Zeus card to complete their legend. However, they didn't have that in their domain to do, but they did have a citizen. What they could do as one of their writings of a legend, and keep in mind that you'll only have two or three, potentially even only one, dependent on the quest you completed, they can choose to write the citizen down into their Elysium in order to complete this set by saying it is a two of Zeus. However, the cost of this citizen is equal to the cost of the card you are replacing. So in this case, it would be two gold to write it, to do the transfer. However, if we talked about a situation where we were collecting sets of one and we wanted to put a citizen in there, that would only cost one because we are treating it as a one card. You can't transfer a citizen into your Elysium from your domain unless you have an existing legend of at least two cards you wanted to add it to. So I couldn't have this card here and choose to add a citizen to it, but if I had two ones, I could add it. You then move on to the end of Epoch phase where players will reset any activate cards in their domain and you'll move the epoch marker up and done you then move on to the next epoch starting once again with the awakening phase you'll do this until you reach the fifth epoch at the end of the fifth epoch that is the end of the game and you will do your final scoring the first thing to do when doing the final scoring is to remove all cards from a player's domain and any single cards that are not part of a legend from players' Elysiums. It's important not to add these to the discard piles as there are cards that refer to discards for final scoring and these should not be included in those amounts. Next, you'll work out your points from any Kronos cards. So as I said earlier, Kronos cards are the ones with the hourglass symbol on and you'll work out any points you are due from those. Then you'll want to calculate the points for the cards in your legend. So to do this, there is a handy player aid card and there is one for each player so you can keep it handy throughout the game. So for family legends, if you have two cards in a family legend, it is worth three points. If you have three cards, it's worth six points. For level legends, you can get two points for two cards, four points for three cards, eight points for four cards, and 12 points for five cards. Then if you are playing with the Ares deck and you have prestige tokens, you'll get a number of points according to who has the most second most, third most, and fourth most prestige points. It's important to note that if you have zero prestige points, you do not count as being included for this calculation. Then you'll need to subtract any of your citizens as each one is worth minus two points. 
Then add all this together and that is your final score. Whoever has the most victory points is the winner. If you have a tie on the victory points, then whoever of those tying has the most gold is then the winner. If there's still a tie, then you are left with a tie. And that is how you play Elysium. I hope you have found this video useful and if you have, please do share it with your friends and family and also check out the rest of the videos on the channel and subscribe to the channel. And of course, please do also check us out on social media. We are on Facebook and also on Twitter. And as always, thanks for watching and bye for now.